Tonight's event is hosted by the School of Humanities at the University of Brighton, where I teach, and by the Politics, Philosophy and Aesthetics Research Group. I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have Caroline Lucas, uh, who will be making the green case to remain in. She is, of course, elected MP for Brighton Pavilion uh, since 2010. She served as the leader of the Green Party between 2008 and 2012. And between 1999 and 2010, she served as one of the party's first MEPs, uh, representing the South East region for the Green Party until she became the United Kingdom's first Green MP. Making the socialist argument to leave uh, the EU, we have uh, Tom Hickey, who is a principal lecturer in uh, politics and philosophy at the University of Brighton a trade unionist, an activist, and a member of the Socialist Workers' Party. What I'd like to do is to take a vote, both before and after we've had, uh, <laughs> we've heard support. Um, from our speakers. It's not gladiatorial, right? <laughs> no. And the contributions from the floor, and to see whether anything, anything shifts after this event. So, if we move to the first vote, um, and I'll do my best to accurately count, there are three positions here uh, for you to uh, register your vote in. One is to remain in the EU, the second is to come out, and the third is, I don't know. <laughs> okay? um, so, let's try this. Who thinks at this point that we should remain within the EU? Wow. Do I Mind have to move? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely more pressure on me there, because sure. I could lose these people. OK, do I really need to count this? <laughs> um, yes, let's see. Do it the other way around. Yeah, I was going to say, OK, brilliant show of hands. Who at this point thinks we should come out? OK, that is easier to count. Thank you. What? 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Thank you. 24. And who at this point really doesn't know? Okay, thank you. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. I did count you. I did count you. Yeah, 27. Thank you. Okay, 27. So, in is a lot. <laughs> Out at the moment is 24. And a don't know is 27. So, thank you. Okay, so without further ado, Tom Hickey. This isn't going to work. I'm not going to be able to convince that many of you. <laughs> but let's start with some of the absurdities that have been said about uh, the European Union and the current debate that the right is conducting. Because if you look at some of the things that are saying, they are quite absurd. You have Nigel Farage, um, sometime a member of something or other, now a member of UKIP, that exit from Europe would restore democracy to the UK. You've got the double absurdity of Ian Duncan Smith telling us that we should get out because of the danger of further welfare cuts. You couldn't believe it. You couldn't write it. You couldn't imagine it. You've got Gove and Johnson telling us that the UK would be economically better off outside the EU. And then, of course, you've got the Prime Minister, David Cameron, and what's he telling us? That the UK outside the EU um, would risk Europe having another war, another continental war. And you have Osborne telling us that the value of our houses would collapse uh, if the UK exited. Now, all of these things are absurd, but I think you have to register something else about them as well. They are simultaneously, as well as being absurd, an expression of desperation on the one hand, and importantly, an exercise in dissembling on the other. Desperation, of course, from the Prime Minister's side, because um, Mr Cameron has made a gamble on the referendum. 
Um, and that gamble threatens to erupt in his face and become a disaster, splitting the Tory party irrevocably and opening the possibility of something that he doesn't want, an exit from Europe, which would completely destabilize his particular Tory project. Um, when he designed this referendum, it was simply designed to see off UKIP as a threat to the Tory party. What he forgot, or maybe he wasn't concentrating so much enamored as he was with the heads of pigs uh, when he was studying history, um, that actually referenda are highly unpredictable weapons to use for a politician. But importantly, it's dissembling because this debate is about in or out on the one hand, but has nothing really to do with democracy or with the benefit for the majority of people that live in the United Kingdom. And it's certainly nothing to do with European peace. In fact, what it is about is that there are the differences between them over the best way in which to implement the neoliberal policies that are the dominant policies of the, uh, of the European Union, the market-friendly policies that are imposed on us here in Britain in the form of austerity. Unfortunately, there are many, indeed it seems from tonight's vote, most on the left, who are being lured into these false terms of the debate. Certainly the Trade Union Congress in this country and the left of the Labour Party, which it has to be said, when Britain first entered the European Union, the Labour Party um, and the TUC were opposed to membership or a large section of the left of the Labour Party were opposed to, to membership. But lured also, it seems, and deeply unfortunately is the Green Party. Um, that's unfortunate, not least, because this is something that also involves Caroline Lucas, who, and I'm probably going to embarrass you now, um, is without doubt the best parliamentary representative for which a constituency could wish, and has been a principal <laughs> defender of justice <laughs> and exposure of camp. <laughs> Wrong color, but right politics. <laughs> What I want to argue is, is six separate things. First, that the European Union is not a guarantee of our employment rights. Second, that exit from it would not mean the expulsion of all immigrants from our country and a rampant rise in racism and xenophobia in Britain. That the European Union is not the guarantee tour of human rights at all. Fourthly, that the European Union is not the source of equal pay insofar as it exists in our country and women manage to acquire it, nor is it a guarantor of our holiday entitlements. And that the idea of reforming the EU in all the various ways in which it is deficient in respect of justice and equality, the idea of reforming it, reforming it from within, is of course an admirable ambition. If it wasn't, Caroline wouldn't be supporting it but it is, I'm afraid to say, a forlorn hope. These are, of course, the myths of the European Union, and they are built, I think, on a fundamental misunderstanding of the purpose and functioning of that union. The last thing I want to do is to spell out a case for uh, social justice and campaigning for it that's entirely outside of the European Union, and how such campaigns would be immensely strengthened the campaigns for social justice, if Britain withdrew. I think I only need to mention two words in order to make my case. But of course, in typical lecturer fashion, I shall use thousands. But the two words would be Greece and migration. If anything is going to count as evidence against the European Union as a source of internationalism and solidarity, then the two considerations around those two words, the proper name and the process, must be central to it. Greece, the European Union terrorizing one of its own member states in order to force a democratically elected government, the government of Syriza, to capitulate. Not only to capitulate, but to use a referendum to try and shift the blame for the fact of their surrender to the responsibility of the electorate. Cyprus's government turned the popular no vote then into a yes, agreeing a package of savage austerity cuts, higher taxes, older retirement age, 
more privatization, increased pension contributions, and running government surpluses, even at the time of dis desperate Greek recession, making the situation worse. A surrender by Syriza carried in part with the support, of course, the right-wing parties in the Greek parliament. Last year, the European Union returned with demands for more privatization, of this time of the ports and the airports, and wage cuts in the public sector, further increases in the retirement age, removal of any job protection that existed, tax cuts for the corporate sector, and the ending of collective bargaining agreements for trade unionists. These were measures, not something from which the Greek people would be protected by the European Union, but these were the measures dictated to the Syrian government, to the Greek government, the government of Syriza, uh, by the European Union. The EU revealed its true colors when it came to Greece. It is a ferocious beast committed unqualifiedly to the preservation and the development of the capitalist system which it is there to maintain. In this case, it is austerity and economic blackmail that here are its weapons of choice directed against Greece. But if you think it is only about what happens in that case, only in the case of the default of Greece, you would be mistaken. The European Union and its laws are continually used to justify the outsourcing of services, to pre prevent the renationalization of privatized utilities. The EU's driving core is to create a business-friendly continent. The heart of this concern is not the interests of its peoples or social policies that those peoples might need. It is an economic trading bloc that they seek that can operate and defend the interests of its dominant class and the major corporate interests in it. Look, for instance, at the much heralded free movements that the European Union is supposed to defend. The free movement of goods, of services, of capital, of labor. But of course, these freedoms aren't our equal freedoms. Notice our own prime minister's desperate attempt to alter welfare entitlements in this country in order to close down the possibility of free movement of labor. Watch the leaders of the European Union, and particularly the Council of Ministers and the governments of its states want is simply access to a giant, unprecedented market of 500 million people. That is why, for instance, the European Round Table of Industrialists, made up of the chief executive officers of the 50 biggest Euro-based multinationals, is fully in support of keeping Britain inside Europe. That is why the EU has looked so favorably, at least with the exception of one government until last week, on the agreement to and introduction of the laws associated with TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which represents, for those of you who know anything about it, you will know it already, for those of you who don't, represents further privatization, blocks on the renationalization of any privatized utilities, corporate lawsuits against governments for any policies implemented that hamper profits. And that's not something that is only going to come in after the introduction of TTIP. If it gets onto the statute books, it's already there. Um, you have Vattenfall, the Swedish energy company, now suing the German government for three billion pounds of lost profits as a result of the German government's decision to divest from nuclear power. This, then, is a policy for a strategic trading bloc that enables greater competition. That's what it's about. But it's no longer about greater competition between the European Union on the one hand and the United States of America on the other. That was yesterday. That was yesterday's news. The competition that they're looking for now is a joint competitive position for the EU and the United States in relation to what in the next decades is going to become their major economic competitor and challenger and that's China. Let's be clear about what this means. If Jeremy Corbyn was ever to become prime minister, and I hope that he does soon, if that were to happen, possibly with the support at least of some members of the Green Party, and if he wanted 
to renationalize the privatized sectors of the National Health Service, he would be unable to do so under the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. So he would have to withdraw from the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership if he wanted to renationalize those parts of the National Health Service. But his government will not be able to withdraw because the EU will not allow member states to derogate from such an agreement once it is signed. Preserving the National Health Service in those circumstances, renationalizing the privatized parts of it, would then require withdrawal from the European Union. The European Union is not, of course, simply an empire, though one would be forgiven to thinking that it was, given the dominance of the German economy uh, within it. And it's not that empire, because all you have to do, for instance, is to look at France and see that this empire, if it were such a thing, has at its very heart something already pulling itself apart. What do we mean, for instance, in any event, by France in this case, when we say that France is at the heart of the European Union? We certainly don't mean the French, because France is, of course, now viciously divided, indeed divided as never before since 1968. In March, over one million people filled the streets in protests as workers and students struck against French government policy, the work law. In many cities, there were tens of thousands on the street. There are 100,000 in Toulouse alone. In Marseille, there were too many to count. And in La Havre, the city was completely blockaded by dockers and lorry drivers. Why? It was the work law, which does what? It makes it easier to sack workers. It ends the 35-hour week. It ends, in other words, the work code that people have benefited from over the past period. It lowers wages. All of these things being introduced, not by the equivalent, a French equivalent of a conservative government, by a French equivalent of a Labour government, a right-wing Labour government, it has to be said, under Francois Hollande. Attempts at state repression against this protest have actually made the situation worse for the government because angry people who previously weren't involved can't bear to see people being beaten up by the CRS riot police. And the government's desperation in those circumstances is what? What do they turn to? They turn to racism. And how do they do it? Well, let me give you a perfect example. The minister, Laurence Roussillon, Minister for Women and Children's Rights. She compared women who defended the wearing of the veil against the French government's ban as comparable to, as she put it, Negroes who were in favor of slavery in the United States of America. And why do I say these things in a debate about the European Union? Because it's not that Francois Hollande has decided that these are good policies to follow, independently of France's position in the European Union. These are the policies demanded of a socialist government in France if that government is going to survive in circumstances dictated by the European Union. And in those circumstances, we have to make a sharp distinction between internationalism, for instance, that says that you have a choice to be internationalist and stay in the European Union because that is in some sense better than the nation states, the separate nation states that preceded it. Or on the other hand, you have to retreat into some form of nationalism and go back to the nation state circumstances. That, I think, is a false choice. It's a false choice because all one has to do is to look at what is happening in respect of migration and see how support of the European Union represents support for an organization that is responsible for turning the Mediterranean into a sea of death. Because people are not dying there because of the weather or because of bad ships. They're not dying there because of people smugglers or people traffickers, and these things are often confused in the minds of politicians. They are dying because of the immigration controls imposed by the European Union and its decision 
to pull back the ships that could have saved the people in foundering boats. So I say to those who want to claim that internationalism drives you to stay in the EU, you are making a category mistake. Internationalism is about fighting to defend the right to life of those migrants, and you can't do that by supporting the European Union. You have to break from a European Union that is responsible for their deaths. You have to build campaigns against the racism of people like Minister Roussillon. And unless we do that, what we're doing is investing in the myths of what the European Union stands for. We are covering our eyes or closing our eyes to the reality of this as a partnership that serves the interests of those 50 chief executive officers of the largest 50 transnational companies based in the European Union. So this is that kind of choice. We are being sucked into making a mistake if we don't realize that to defend justice, to aspire to equality, requires getting out of this club designed for the rich of this continent. Well, thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all here, and uh, I'm uh, very grateful for this opportunity for this debate. And I want to say that I very much respect the position that Tom has put forward. And I have to say that if I thought that by withdrawing from the EU, we would be guaranteed a government run by Tom and colleagues of his, then I would be a lot less worried than I am standing here today. But... I'd be worried. But... As we know, that is not the transaction that is on offer in front of us. The people who are likely to be running this country if we leave the EU are people like Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage and IDS and Michael Gove. And if that seems bad enough, just think they're going to be supported by people like Marine Le Pen and Donald Trump. I rest my case. But I too will use a few more words uh, to, to put that case because I think this debate absolutely goes to the heart of what country we want to be, what kind of future we want for ourselves and our kids. And I will be the first to admit that the EU has its faults and that the governments at the top table right now certainly don't share my politics. But I believe that to change it, we need to be part of it. And for me, the bottom line is that I fail to see how Britain can possibly be more effective working on its own when it comes to facing cross-border challenges, as so many of the challenges are that face us today, like climate change, like the refugee crisis, like the excesses of the international financial system. Now, of course, the EU needs to be reformed. It needs to be made more transparent and accountable, more accessible and democratic. But do you know what? So does Westminster. And I don't see many people suggesting we leave the, e the, the UK because we don't like the policies at Westminster right now. And at least our members of the European Parliament are elected by proportional representation. Now, hearing some Tory MPs lecture us about democracy when they come from a government elected with 24% of the popular vote, frankly, sticks in my throat. So I think we need to stay in it to change it. And we also need to change, certainly, its end goals away from ever greater competition and privatisation towards greater cooperation and stronger public services. But this is exactly where I think we need to distinguish between the EU institutions on the one hand and the current policies that are being pushed by the predominantly right-wing governments who sit around the table of the EU today. Tom says that the left has been lured into the false terms of this debate. But much as I respect him, I think he's given you false terms for this debate. Because the issue is not whether or not we like the policies currently coming out of the EU. It's whether we think the EU institutions are the right ones that we need to face the challenges that we are, we are, we are up against. 
and then how we mobilise in each of our member states to make sure we get the right governments around the table. So let me take TTIP as an example. People regularly ask, how can you possibly support the EU when the EU is negotiating what is indeed a terrible trade agreement behind closed doors with the US, and part of this trade agreement is indeed the Investor State Dispute Settlement Mechanism, which allows private corporations to sue democratically elected governments if they believe those governments are setting up so-called barriers to trade. Those barriers to trade are, of course, what we would call health and safety regulations, environmental regulations, and so on. Now, I am campaigning against TTIP every bit as vigorously as Tom. But the truth is that it is our own government which is the key cheerleader for TTIP. The truth is that our own government will be merrily including that dispute settlement system into a whole set of bilateral trade agreements if we come out of the EU, as previous governments already have done. So please believe me, if we retreat from the EU, we do not end up with a lovely, cuddly, friendly trade policy. We get something that is even more aggressive than we have today. And worse than that, we also have to fight it on our own without our colleagues in the rest of the EU. Because right now, over three million people have um, signed the, the petition against TTIP across the EU. 250,000 people have been marching against it in Berlin. If we want to stop TTIP, what we have to do is to persuade MEPs from all the different member state countries to vote against it. That's what democracy is about. If they vote to do that, it stops in its tracks. So let's be mobilising against those governments rather than against the actual institutions themselves. Because if you put right-wing bigotry into the EU, it's not very surprising that you get right-wing bigotry out of the EU. What matters is who are the governments around the table. And I'm old enough to remember a time when the EU 15 had a huge number of green MPs who were, were actually in governments across the EU in those wonderful uh, halcyon days, and they were environment ministers. And as a result, we got some really positive environment policy coming out of the EU. You know, Tom talked about the way in which Greece has been treated, and I agree with him. I was one of the first to say this is a coup against a democratic government. But I think it's worth contemplating that even someone like Yanis Varoufakis, who has been on the sharp end of policies coming from Germany and others over this, are still saying we need to stay in the EU to change the EU. And he has set up a pan-European reform movement that is gathering momentum in many countries across the EU to try to do exactly that. Again, Tom spoke incredibly eloquently about the sea of death when it comes to people who are seeking refuge on our shores and who are being allowed to die in the Mediterranean. But do you know what? The, the bit of the EU that is most, if you like, the most, the most EU part of it, not the member states, but the Commission, the Commission actually came up with a responsible and relatively fair policy whereby refugees would be allocated between different member states on the basis of GDP, population density, uh, jobs, the number of, of refugees they'd already taken, they came up, in other words, with some kind of strategy. And it was the member state governments that threw it back in their faces. So again, if we think that we're going to have a better job of showing compassion as we must to refugees leaving places like Syria and Iraq, if we think we're going to have a better job doing it in a government led by Boris Johnson, well then I'm sorry, but I think we've got a very different idea of what compassion means. So I would go further. I think not only does the European story need to be defended, I think it needs to be celebrated. Countries with very different histories and cultures have come together, choosing to share some degree of sovereignty while keeping their own traditions in order to work for the common good. I think there's actually something quite moving about that. I think we should be celebrating free movement, not keep apologizing for it, as you will hear from many others in this debate. What an amazing gift it is that we can live and love and work and retire in 27 other member states of the EU. For all of its cumbersome and difficult processes and procedures, how remarkable it is really that on this troubled continent, that over the past 100 years and more has been so tragically prone to conflict, it is now inconceivable that we would have war between us and that we resolve our differences now not on the battlefield but in the debating chamber. You know, I find that immensely moving that what brought the EU together in those very early days after the Second World War was that pledge to make war not only unthinkable between the EU member states, but impossible as well. The EU's soft power 
has brought peace and stability among its own members and helped countries free themselves from dictatorships. And the challenge now is to extend those values to our trade and foreign policies. Now, those on the Leave side sometimes make the case that by working with others, somehow we completely lose our sovereignty. But here's the thing. Sovereignty is not like pregnancy. It is not the case that either you are or you're not. It is perfectly possible to pool certain elements of sovereignty if we believe it's in our national interest, as we have already with literally tens of thousands of multilateral agreements to which the UK has signed up. So for me, the bottom line is this, that in a world beset by economic and security and ecological problems that show no respect for borders, countries do better by working together rather than by splitting apart. And so let me just illustrate that, looking at three issues in particular. The first is restraining global capital. The EU has actually been instrumental in helping us tackle the huge abuses of power by wealthy individuals and global corporations that transcend national borders. The EU, the EU has led the way on tax avoidance by coordinating the international drive to crack down on individuals and institutions who hide money offshore. It's established tax cooperation procedures among its own member states, and in the wake of the HSBC Swiss tax scandal, it signed transparency agreements with havens like Switzerland, Liechtenstein, San Marino, and many others. And the UK would not be part of those if we left the EU. And the EU has been more prepared than many national governments, including our own, to tackle action against multinationals like Fiat, Starbucks, and Apple to ensure that they pay their fair share of tax. And it's the EU that is championing the so-called Tobin tax, the tax on currency speculation, in the teeth of opposition from exactly our country. And it's the EU that's brought in a, a cap on bonus, back bankers' bonuses. It's brought in stronger regulation for financial institutions, which is precisely the reason that so many hedge funds are on the other side of the debate trying to persuade us to come out of the EU because they don't want that kind of regulation. And I come to workers' rights, and I believe the EU has protected, enhanced, and extended the right of working people in the UK for a generation or more. It is the EU that guaranteed a minimum amount of paid holiday, that enshrined paternity and maternity leave in law, that gave part-time agency workers the same rights as their full-time colleagues, that ensured that no one was working seven days straight uh, should have to work an eighth without having 24 hours rest. It was the EU that passed legislation which gives workers a 20-minute break every six hours. Many of these measures were introduced as part of the social chapter, a piece of legislation that was detested and derided by the Tory right, with a venomous disdain that betrays the real agenda that they would pursue if Britain voted to leave. They call it all restrictive red tape. I think we should call it the minimum conditions that every worker in a modern, civilised society should expect. The right for part-time workers to be treated in the same way as full-time workers was introduced in 2000, thanks to trade union campaigning right across Europe. And that's why nearly every major union supports remaining in the EU. The TUC General Secretary, Francis O'Grady, has said, and I quote, the bulk of the rights at work that matter to us originated in Europe. A Brexit would have massive implications for jobs, rights, and the very fabric of the UK. If you take that floor away, workers will be worse off. Tim Roach, the new General Secretary of the GMB, says Europe, although not perfect, has, and I quote, given us the most progressive employment legislation in the country, bar none. And Len McCluskey has acknowledged, and again I quote, it is undeniable that for millions of UK workers and their families, the EU is the best hope for their jobs and fundamental rights. Now that is the social Europe that we want to defend, and the Europe that people like Boris Johnson want to destroy. Boil it down to the single market, he said a few years ago. Scrap the social charter, he is on record as saying it. So please don't be under any illusion that these protections will be safe if Leave campaigners win the argument and the UK votes to leave the EU. You might think that no government would be daft enough to risk being punished at the ballot box by removing these rights, but forget not that it wasn't that long ago that the Tory government suggested asking workers to give up employment rights in return for receiving a small number of shares in the company they work for. And so in my last minutes, let me make a few arguments about the environmental reasons why Britain is better off in Europe. And of course, environmental problems absolutely illustrate the importance of working cross-border because environmental problems do not queue politely at borders waiting for their passports to be checked. They are, by their very nature, cross-border problems that need cross-border solutions. Take air pollution, for example. Up to 50% of the concentrations of fine particulate matter, the main cause of premature death in this country, are from emissions in other European countries. That is something we cannot tackle on our own. And that's why the EU's clean air policy package is so important. 
Similarly, it's European laws which have forced the sewage out of Britain's bathing waters, the acid rain out of Britain's atmosphere. It's got rid of the most dangerous chemicals in our environment and the carbon pollution of our motor vehicles. The challenges that span national boundaries, our EU membership helps us avoid duplication, increase coordination and pool limited resources. And if you look at things like the Birds and the Habitats Directive, they are far stronger than any of the national protection that we have in this country. And they work. If you take birds, for example, according to research, the most consistent single factor in a species fate is whether or not it is protected by the EU Birds Directive or not. And that would go if we left the EU. And if anyone genuinely thinks that the UK government is just as likely to enact legislation in this area on its own, I would suggest that they haven't been paying attention. We currently have a Prime Minister who talks of getting rid of the green crap, who's made it his mission to have a bonfire of regulation whether or not it's useful. A Chancellor who has said that the EU nature laws place what he calls ridiculous costs on British firms. A government that has instructed its own MEPs to vote against laws to improve inspection on vehicle emissions. And if we have Cameron replaced by Boris, then we also have the lovely prospect of a Prime Minister who apparently doesn't even believe that climate change is caused by human activity. Again, I rest my case. By staying inside the EU, the UK can use that as a platform for our strong environmental policies on climate change because we have been able to show some leadership on that. And by taking a leading role in the EU, we've enabled the rest of the EU to match our ambition. And as a result of that, we were able to get a deal at Paris, which again was not everything that we would have wanted it to be, but it was a lot better than we feared it might be. So for climate change, if for no other reason, it feels to me that we absolutely have to be staying inside the EU, working together, because we know that governments are more comfortable taking long-term decisions when their neighbours and partners commit to the same obligations as well. It means as well that there isn't a race to the bottom on environmental standards or workers' standards as factories try to find the cheapest way to, uh, to do their business. And the very last thing I want to say, and this comes back to peace, and Tom made a bit of a joke about about. about Cameron saying that if we came out of the EU, then we risk World War III. Well, I don't think that, but I do think we shouldn't underestimate what the EU was built on and why it's so, still so important. Because the EU we have today is not an abstract project that was born in some kind of continental think tank. The imperative to share sovereignty in Europe and ensure that economic competition does not spill yet again into conflict was built on the blood and the bones of Europeans killed in the disastrous first half of the 20th century. And the EU is a pragmatic response to our failure to manage the disruptive forces of nationalism and industrialization. And on the whole, it has tamed the aggressive ambitions of European elites who disputed control of the continent for centuries. Now, I don't pretend the EU has been the only force for peace, nor do I claim that peace is impossible without the EU. But what I do believe is that one of the foremost reasons that this institution is worth preserving is because it makes peace more likely. So yes to the EU, yes to reforming it, but to change it, you need to be in it, as many other organisations across the EU are working to do, and I find such inspiration from those movements in everywhere from Spain to Portugal to Greece and beyond, who, like us, are having these debates about what kind of EU they want. And I believe that another Europe is not only possible, but she is on her way. To paraphrase the wonderful Arundhati Roy, on a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you. They are uh, maybe about one million more people from the EU. So it's only this can you do. When we have been left on the side, separate we must control what they do. After uh, Caroline and Tom have spoken, we will take another vote as a way of concluding the evening. So if I can invite Caroline up to sum up. Well, it's usually hard enough to remember three questions, which is the way it's normally done. I think we've had about 43. Um, so I do apologise if I don't answer every single question, but I will do my best. Um, and the first uh, issues that were raised was about, um, you know, would, would a Brexit give us this impetus for something new and more exciting? And the particular example that was given early on was, would that mean that we um, then get Scottish independence more quickly? 
And I would just say that I think that's a very high price, price to pay for it. I'm, not, I'm, I'm in favour of Scottish independence, but I just think, you know, to break apart the EU to get it doesn't seem to me to be the best way. And I think that we would actually have turmoil afterwards. And I think it is more likely that the likes of Marine Le Pen would be there ready to exploit it rather than having this wonderful opportunity of, of, of something better breaking through at that point. I was asked about where, where do you get your idealism from when it comes to the EU. And I don't think I'm, I'm rosy tinted, rose tinted glasses about, about the EU. I've been a member of the European Parliament. I've seen up front just how cumbersome and flawed the EU institutions are. So I'm not speaking from some kind of myth about the EU. But I genuinely do think there is something moving about countries that have spent an awful lot of time fighting one another now coming together to find solutions through debate and discussion, however long-term and tedious that might sometimes seem at the time. And I do think that as a result, we have had some extraordinarily good policy. We've spoke, spoken a lot about the policy that is not so good, but I want to come back to some of those key environmental policies that have meant that our seas are much cleaner to swim in, that our air is much better to breathe. And when it isn't, when the UK is in default, on those air pollution policies, then there's a legal mechanism at EU level to really bring them into line, where the British government is not into, in line at, at the moment. So I think that my sense about the EU is actually something that is absolutely grounded in pragmatism, but also grounded in the idea that actually working together, generally speaking, when it comes to incredibly complex and difficult problems that we face, is a better way to tackle them rather than retreating and working on our own. There were some questions about refugees and, and, um, uh, and free movement. I want to clarify, when I was talking about free movement, I meant within the EU. That's how that phrase is usually used, free movement within the EU. That's what I'm celebrating. I'm, I also want to see a far more compassionate policy towards refugees from outside of the EU. But again, I think it's far more likely to happen as a result of being a member of the EU. I come back to what I said before about the European Commission actually coming up with a far more workable, generous, compassionate policy than any single member state has done. Uh, and, and I think that that was something that we should um, uh, support. Um, we've been talking about whether or not, uh, you know, has, has the European Union changed over time? A number of people had said it's all very well talking about reform, but there's no evidence to suggest the EU has ever reformed. I think that is absolutely wrong. It hasn't reformed as fast as I would like, for sure. But certainly, the EU started off as a, as a purely economic unit, and it's now got the social chapter. It's now got a whole raft of environmental policy. It is now absolutely trying to contain capitalism in a way that I don't see any other single member state inside the EU doing. I come back to the fact that the bankers' bonuses, the restrictions on, on, on takeovers and so forth, because we've got the monopolies and competitions uh, laws at EU, far stronger than anything we've ever had uh, in the UK. Is that going to be standing up to global capitalism on its own? No, of course it's not. But I think it gives us a better chance of working together with Podemos, with elements from Syriza, from you know, the mayor of Barcelona, these, these people who are working together to put forward a very different kind of economic model that I think we very urgently need, and I certainly don't see much sign of happening if Britain is ruled outside of the EU. There were some very important <clears throat> questions about internationalism. The fact that Africa wasn't mentioned, and I, I take that rebuke um, personally. I think, I think you're right to, 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 to make that point. I used to work for a development NGO for 10 years before I was in the European Parliament. I worked on trade policy for that development NGO. And I have seen that the EU can be both a force for good and bad, certainly. I would not be here saying that EU trade policy has been great for the countries of Africa. It has not. But then neither do you think would the UK trade policy have been, and whether it's been under Labour or Tories, they have been more aggressive about trying to open up those poorer countries to uh, the markets uh, and, the, and the big co corporations uh, in the rest of the EU, whether that was Peter Mandelson under Labour or whether it was trade commissioners under the Tories. So uh, again, I would argue that we do not get better policies by retreating. We get better policies by fighting for them with our colleagues in the rest of the uh, EU. Someone made the point about uh, not having um, the vote for EU nationals. I completely agree with you that that is wrong. I fought very hard both for EU nationals to have a vote in this referendum and for 16-year-olds to have a vote in this referendum. And sadly, we didn't uh, succeed. We still came back to talking about TTIP. But again, I would make the case that we're more likely to fight and defeat TTIP by staying inside the EU, working, for example, with France. France is actually blocking TTIP as it happens right now. If we retreat, we're actually going to have those same kinds of TTIP policies put into bilateral trade agreements, and we won't have those colleagues to be fighting alongside us in order to, um, in order to um, uh, challenge them. Um, 
Someone mentioned the UN, um, and, and I am, would love, love to see the, the, the UN um, you know, being reformed uh, and being taken more notice of. But one question I would ask about the UN is, you know, why do we think that it's right that the Security Council has a seat for France and a seat for the UK? Why is there not an EU seat? And in return, then make more spaces for developing countries who absolutely should be there. The Security Council is a complete anachronism uh, and we need to have others there. Um, I'm happy to say that I'm an anti-capitalist, but the question that is in front of us is whether or not those anti-capitalist policies are more likely to be successful by staying in the EU or more likely if we come away. And I don't see any evidence to suggest that we're going to find that any easier by coming away. There's been lots of language around bunch of bureaucrats, which frankly is a little bit lazy because actually the policies that are coming out of the EU now are being voted upon by a majority of member state governments and a majority of the European Parliament. Another thing that has changed across time when it comes to the EU has been exactly the power of the European Parliament. It started off as simply a consultative body. It now has co-decision policy-making powers on an increasing number of issues, uh, and, and that is uh, changing and, and improving uh, all the time. Um, gosh, what else? Uh, I, 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 I really have sympathy with, with, with a number of people who have said, what, what has this debate got to do with us? And I really worry about that because I understand where that question comes from. And I think it shows there's been an enormous failure over decades to really communicate better about the EU, to have a better media when it comes to the EU. Why is it that we only ever have media about the EU outside of a referendum when we're talking about bent bananas or about uh, you know, silly stories where it's, it's been suitable and, and appropriate and easy for successive governments of both colours to blame the EU for anything that goes wrong? And as a result of that, that scapegoating of the EU, people have got all kinds of ideas that it's totally undemocratic, that we have no say in it, that it's imposed from above. And that is not where the EU is at now. And I think that, you know, if one good thing could come out of this referendum, it is precisely a debate so we can try and re-engage people with the future of the EU and the kind of EU that we want to have. And that's perhaps where I will end. Because I do think it is exciting that more and more people are talking about what kind of an EU we want, one that is based on social justice and environmental protection, and how that is growing. The fact that we did get a better deal in Paris than we might have hoped was a sign of at least some small hope, however uh, far from uh, what we absolutely uh, wanted. Someone talked about the universities and young people. You know, for me, you know, the way in which the EU allows us to work and study in 27 other member countries is, is, is a wonderful thing. The Erasmus program is a wonderful thing. And although uh, people on the Leave side might say, well, the Erasmus program is open to a couple of countries that aren't part of the EU, actually not on the same terms at all. So the Erasmus program, which allows people to, to be able to go and study in other countries, um, is, is, I think, a, a great thing. And if we just look around us and see the contribution that EU nationals have made to our country, are we really saying, you know, just, just go back and do you really want all of those people who've retired to Spain back in return? I ask you to think about that quite carefully <laughs> before, you, uh, before you make a final decision. And so my final point would simply be this. I don't, think, I don't think it is a decision between the EU on the one hand and globalism and internationalism on the other. I am an internationalist, absolutely. But I see our membership of the EU enabling us to be able to reach out with more influence into that global world, far from diminishing us. I think that the EU multiplies British influence, it multiplies our ideas, and it multiplies our values, and for that reason we should stay in. Well, I started off on a losing wicket with the vote, and then there was the conclusive argument, which was the face of Nigel Farage on the television the next morning. So what am I to say? Uh, Caroline said that we were tossing compliments around and she said uh, she'd be quite happy to, if I was a member of some government, but we, I wouldn't be after the event. God, if I was a member of the government, I think everyone should be worried. Um, I want to deal with uh, one question that somebody raised about whether or not it's better for people to be, for countries to be working together. I think it was Caroline in her talk, rather than apart. I'm concerned about what on earth that means. What is it for countries to be working together? Um, when ESA is thinking in terms of countries, or one th thinks in terms of the different peoples who make up those countries, what is it to work with Germany? That means working, if it means everybody, with Angela Merkel. It means working with the alternative for Germany, 
a crypto fascist organization. It means working uh, with the left, Die Linke, in Germany. So what is this talk about working together with other countries? If we're interested in social justice, and if we're interested in equality, and if we're interested in pursuing those things, it's not a question of working with countries. It's about pursuing, in each of the countries, whether they be part of an association or not, the appropriate kinds of policies. So we, I think, have to get beyond this talk about working with countries as if the EU was about that in the first place. Caroline spoke uh, extensively about the achievements of the EU in terms of the environment. And she spoke about cleaner waters and cleaner air to breathe and the protection of the birds, all of which are important things. And yet, in Britain, in Spain, in Greece, in Hungary, in Romania, many of these directives of the EU are simply ignored. And what does the EU do about ignoring these directives? Absolutely nothing at all. And what about the agricultural policy? The most environmentally destructive policy followed by the, in Europe is without doubt the common agricultural policy, a policy that subsidized farmers to engage in a dramatic overproduction of foodstuffs, much of which then has to be destroyed, an intensive farming process that destroys the wildlife of the habitats in which the farming is taking place, and which disperses grants, actually grants, allocated to farmers on the basis of their wealth. The size of your farm determines how much you get. One of the greatest beneficiaries, and probably the largest beneficiary of the common agricultural policy in this country is Her Majesty the Queen, who benefits from the common agricultural policy subsidies to the tune of 415,000 pounds a year. I think actually we could find uh, something better to do with that. We were asked about why there was no reference in uh, any of the contributions thus far to the third world, or particularly and specifically to Africa, well, I will make one. Well, I'll make the reference to Africa about the policy of the EU, which sanctions European fishing trawlers to fish off the west coast of Africa, and indeed, occasionally off the east coast of Africa, consigning fishing village after fishing village on the west coast of Africa to poverty and destitution, and on the east coast, driving villagers and fishy, fisher persons uh, to piracy. In terms of carbon emissions, actually, if you look at the carbon emissions in the EU, the, the hoped for reduction in carbon emissions in the EU, they're less than actually this British government supports at the moment. So I'm not convinced about this argument about the European Union in relation to the environment. A key question I think we, we were asked was asked from somebody over here about what about people who are settled in Britain? and don't even get a vote in this uh, referendum. And what about the Brits that are settled over here, overseas? Some three million of them, I understand, resettled in, in Europe. Well, yes, of course these people should have a vote, and in this referendum as well. But I didn't take that to be the thrust of that question, because what I took to be the thrust, and I wrote it down as a quotation I didn't want to forget, was when the person said that she wanted to live in a world without frontiers. That's the world I want to live in. And it's to that we should be voting yes, not yes to the European Union, because the European Union is not about voting for a world without frontiers. The European Union is about voting for fortress Europe, whose walls will be designed to keep others out. The EU, therefore, is not part of a project for uniting the world's population for dissolving the borders that keep us apart. Um, and then there's the question of reform. Caroline's argument, I respect the argument, but I think it's a mistaken argument, is that the EU has done some good things and many uh, less respectable things, but it's an organization that can be reformed. And I think that in one sense, that's right. The sense in which it can be reformed is in theory, in a lecture or a debate, but in practice, there will be no effective reform of the EU. I don't know if you know, I suspect that Caroline knows, about the number of corporate lobbyists that work in Brussels alone. 
The corporate European observatory reports to us that there are no less than 30,000 people employed by the major corporations, not just of Europe, of the world as well, resident in Brussels to lobby the key figures in the European Union to make sure that no European policies pass that contradict the interests of the corporate sector that they recommend, that, that they represent. 30,000. I understand that that's equivalent to the total number of people employed by the European Union in Brussels. And imagine that the governments of Europe, which dictate the councils of ministers, um, to imagine that they, in some sense, are going to allow popular influence to shift their policies of driving through neoliberal policy, I think is, quite frankly, delusional. They will not do that. They will not allow it. The governments of the separate countries committed to neoliberalism will not allow that to happen. And, of course, the European Parliament is, of course, as I'm sure Caroline will be the first to admit and to confirm to us, largely powerless in relation to the Council of Ministers. No. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. It's we just obviously not going... true. It's not okay. true. We're going to have to have another debate about <laughs> the structure of the EU. Um, I, I want to finish simply by saying this. The key question for us is what the EU represents. Not that it has this policy that we are in favour and all this raft of policies that we might be against. That's not the fundamental issue. The fundamental issue is the character of the organisation itself. What it was set up to do, what it has attempted to prosecute during its existence, and what its immediate future is going to be in terms of policy. People do change their minds, and I hope that some of you will change your mind as well. I'll give you one example of somebody who has been, up until the time of the terrorization of Greece, from the first moment that Britain entered it, a trenchant supporter of British membership of the European Union. He's a world-renowned intellectual. He's a famous Marxist scholar. His name is Perry Anderson sometime editor of the journal New Left Review. And with the breaking of Syriza by the Troika, Anderson wrote the following words. The European Union is now widely seen for what it has become, an oligarchic structure riddled with corruption, built on denial of any form of popular sovereignty, enforcing a bitter economic regime of privilege for the few, and duress for the many. I couldn't have put that any better. I never can put things better than Perry Anderson, damn his hide. Um, but supporting EU membership in this, represent in this referendum is for those kinds of reasons, not some form of progressive internationalism. What I want to argue, and I hope that I've persuaded some of you of, is that far from that being a kind of internationalism, it is a willful refusal to see what the EU is really about, and therefore, however unintentionally, a vote to stay in the EU is a vote for neoliberal austerity, which the vast majority in this room do not support. Okay, we'll finish with um, another vote. Uh, remember, there are three positions, vote to stay in, vote to leave, and don't know. Uh, the last results were in an awful lot, out 24, and don't know 27. So we'll go from the top again. Who thinks we should stay in the EU? Okay, st still an awful lot. Okay, thank you very much. Who thinks we should come out of the EU? Thank you. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three. 
Okay. 33. Who still doesn't know? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty, thirty one, thirty two, thirty three. Is there no one down here? Did you put your can you thirty four, thirty five, thirty six? You're absolutely right. Okay, don't know on the, at this moment, don't know. Thank you. 36, I said. Okay, well, still an awful lot of people want to stay in, the vast majority. Uh, we have moved from 24 to 33 who have voted to leave. And the don't knows at this point in time, compared to before this um, debate, has moved from 27 to 36. Um, I'm not a pollster. <laughs> it's the kind of victory I could do without. Thank you very much to our speakers and thanks to all of you.